It's kind of amazing. Uh, you might not always be here, but we're having a, a children's thing in the back, a little uh, drive-in thing, and they're just going to have a blast. If you're a regular here, you know that after church, we usually have some snacks out here. I don't think we're going to do that tonight. I think we're going to go crash their party over there. <laughs> I don't know if you guys got to go back there. There's tons of pizza back there. There's cake, there's M&Ms, there's all kinds of stuff. And I, think, I don't think all those kids are going to eat all that stuff. So maybe we might have to go give them a little hand. Maybe I'll just finish early and we'll just go crash it. I know I always say that, that I'm going to finish early. And I know my sound people and my worship guy, I was like, no, really, I might. But, um, you know... There's, there's people in my heart tonight that uh, um, they're going through it right now. And, um, and I don't know who's on your heart, what's going on on your heart right now. If there's somebody you just need to lift up. But maybe we can just spend just a little time uh, praying for them. Um, I don't want to spend a lot, a lot of time. But uh, again, you don't have to go into detail. You can just lift them up to the Lord. If you don't want to pray out loud, you don't have to. But let's just spend a little time before the Lord, and, and if the Lord lays somebody on your heart, just lift them up, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into our study. Father, we, uh, we look to you right now, and God, I just thank you, Lord God, that uh, we get, get together, Lord God, and pray and seek your face. Lord, I know that we're going to open up your word, and we're going to be able to, to share your word, Lord, but Lord, you've been laying these people on my heart, Lord, throughout the day because they're going through it, Lord. And Father, I just want to praise you and thank you that you listen to us, you hear us, Lord. Lord, I, I pray for Brittany and her husband, Lord God, um, having a difficulty, a difficult time, Lord, in their pregnancy and having to lose, uh, lose their babies, Lord, these twins. And so, Lord, we pray for them. I don't know where they're at with you right now, Lord, but I know that her father-in-law and her mom are are walking with you, and I, I don't know if they're there with them or not, Lord, but be, please be comforting them as they have to go through this, Lord. Um, so I just pray for them, lift them up to you. Pray for our brother Kevin, uh, who just had surgery on his eye, and I pray, God, that you would just touch him and heal him. And thank you, Lord, God, that everything went well. And uh, so, Lord, we just pray that, God, you would just minister to these people. We bless you, Lord.
So, Father, we thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayers. We thank you, Lord God, that you are a God who sits on the throne and is attentive to the cries of your people. And, Lord, we thank you even in advance for what you're going to do in these people's lives that we've interceded for. Tonight, Lord God, you have your way. We thank you, Lord, that we would never stop praying, that we would never allow the enemy, Lord God, to lie to us, but that we would be strengthened, Lord, because you do hear us, and we do love you, and thank you. Help us as we open up your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Turn, if you will, to the book of Nahum in the Old Testament. Um, We started last week the book of Nahum, and we were able to to go through the first chapter as we normally do in the Old Testament on Thursday nights. We try to cover at least the chapter. Um, This evening we will be in Nahum chapter 2. As I shared with you last week, the theme of the book of Nahum is Nineveh's doom, which which makes this book of uh, of Nahum unique in in some ways because it's not focused basically on the children of Israel and the northern kingdom, southern kingdom, any of those. In, in other words, it's, it's fo- its main focus is more on a foreign nation. Um, not so much on the nation of God. And it's much like I shared with you the book of Obadiah, whose focus was on the doom of Edom. In, in covering these minor prophets like this, we, we get the understanding that, that the Lord is, is, is concerned for His people, but we also understand that, that the Lord is concerned for others. And, and I think sometimes we need that reminder that He's just not concerned about you, even though He is. He's not just concerned about, about the church locally and, and, and in general, but He's, he's concerned about the lost. Again, we prayed for people. God loves, so loves the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And, and, and so we, we understand that, that, again, He's concerned about His people, but we also understand that He knows exactly what is going on in other countries, in other nations. We, we see this throughout the Word of God, so much so that He deals with them in the way He needs to deal with them. It, to, to the point that nothing escapes his view. And, and we, 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 we tend to forget that, that God is all-knowing, that God is all-powerful, that he is all-present, not just in your life. And again, I, I, I say that, and I would probably will repeat it several times, because we think that the world revolves around us and, and our little sphere of people, but he is at work all the time. And I love the fact that, again, he's concerned about those countries that we think of, that, that, that we kind of look at as like, oh my gosh, they're so cruel, they're so horrible, they're so godless, they're so whatever, and it's like, and God knows exactly what is going on there. And, and that's what we see even as, as we look at this book, that he's not, he's not just talking about his people, but he's talking about what's going to happen in other countries and other nations. The Assyrian nation was one of those nations who God used for His purpose. They were a godless, cruel people. They were horrible people. And yet God used them to to chastise, basically, His people. But they crossed the line. And God would use nations, but they just couldn't help themselves sometimes of crossing the line, whether they knew what that line was or not. God would give them the opportunity to go and discipline his people, chastise his people. But once they crossed that line, he would say like, well, now I have to deal with that. And so when they crossed the line, though, it's not like he didn't give them warnings (laughs) afterwards to repent. And and we see that in the book of of Jonah. That's what the book of Jonah is all about. Here we're we're looking at the doom of Nineveh, but a hundred years earlier, God had sent the prophet Jonah to go and minister to the people. They were a wicked, godless people, and yet he he shares a quick quick message with them, and he's mad that he has to do it. But he says, 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. He wanted them destroyed. He hated them. 
He was honest with it. He was more concerned about a plant than he was about people. More upset that, that, that this died than they would die. And God just challenged him. And, and again, you see that God's love is for those who are created in his image, wherever they're at. But this is where we find ourselves now in the book of Nahum. And so let's read the first seven verses of Nahum chapter 2. It says, He who scatters has come up before your face. Man the fort. Watch the road. Strengthen your flank. Fortify your power mightily. For the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob. Like the excellence of Israel. For the emptiers have emptied them out and ruined the vine branches. The shields of the mighty men are made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots come with flaming torches in the day of his preparation. And the spears are brandished. The chariots rage in the streets. They jostle one, uh, one another in the broad roads. They seem like torches. They run like lightning. He remembers the nobles. They stumble in their walk. They make haste to her walls. And the defense is prepared. The gates of the rivers are open and the palace is dissolved. It is decreed. She shall be led away captive. She shall be brought up, and her maidservants shall lead her as with the voice of doves beating their breasts. Now, even though this book of Nahum is about Nineveh's doom, and, and, and the prophet started the first verse stating that, that it, it, it's, it's coming against them. I also love that, that when, well, the first verse of, of chapter 1, um, but, but I love the fact that, that the prophet, when he started this book, telling us that, that it's going to be about, about Nineveh, of how God's burden is against them. I love the fact that from verse 2 on for several verses, the, the prophet decides to share the characteristics of the Lord and why the Lord would take the measures he would take in avenging his people. And I love the fact that through it all, as he tells us, God will avenge, God will, is furious, God is all these things, but he's also, he, he, he also is slow to anger. He's a jealous God. He will protect his people. He, he tells us all of those things. He tells us about the fact that God controls all, 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 all the earth. All the crazy fires, all the crazy winds, all the crazy earthquakes, all of those things. God is over all of that. And everything that happens on this earth, whether we realize it or not, is just and righteous. Because nobody is going to stand before God and say, you were not just in that situation. You were not righteous in that situation. All of it will always end up being fair and righteous and just. As I shared with you last week, the book of Nahum is, is basically the sequel to the book of, of Jonah. In that about a hundred years earlier, the Lord had sent Jonah to Nineveh with the message of repentance, and they did. But now the time for their destruction has come because they turned against the Lord. And I find it fascinating that a that hundred years is probably, if, if 40 years is a generation as they think, it took less than three generations for people to go back to their wicked ways. So much so that God says, now we're done. But he had compassion on them. He loved them. He loved these people that were so wicked, that, that treated people like nothing, like dirt. And yet, he, he was kind enough, because he loved them, to warn them. 
And I shared this verse with you last week from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that the Lord is not slack concerning His promises, His promise. As some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It holds true today. I think oftentimes we think like, Lord, why aren't you acting? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you, why aren't you, why aren't you? It's because he's long-suffering. And praise the Lord that he's long-suffering, right? What if he wasn't long-suffering with you? (laughs) What if he had a short fuse like you do? What if he wasn't as patient? But he is, and he's long-suffering. And we see that time and time and time again. Chapter 1 kind of basically gave us more or less a general statement about about the Lord's judgment upon His enemies. In this case, the Assyrians, in particular, the city of Nineveh. But but now we move into a a more specific description of that kind of judgment and what exactly is going to be happening here now I, I don't know as as and I know I'm not a great reader and, and maybe I, I stumble here and there but but if you were reading along and you're kind of into this I, I love the fact that we get a very vivid picture here especially in this chapter we get a very a vivid picture of how Nineveh would be attacked how, how Nineveh would be defeated how Nineveh would be plundered as we'll see even in, in chapter eight. Or, or verse 8. But we also get a glimpse of, of how God will restore Judah to its glory. We get a reminder of all of that. We, we, know, we know from history that in, in 612 BC, the Medes and the Babylonians, they, they, they came together Neither one of them at that time was its own superpower. They would eventually. The Babylonians would become a superpower eventually, but not at this moment. The Medes, along with the Persians, they would would come after the Babylonians and they would become a superpower and they would rule the earth for a time as well. But at this moment, at this time, in, in in, in 612 BC, the Assyrians, those guys have been ruling and reigning for a while. They, they, they've been going after every nation and just destroying and decimating nations. And yet, in, 12, in, in 612 B.C., the Medes and the Babylonians, they, they come together and they attack the Assyrians. And now the Lord uses them, just like He had used the Assyrians before, but now the Lord uses them to judge the Assyrians. By coming after this evil and, and, and corrupt capital city of Nineveh. Now, now what I find fascinating, and maybe I shouldn't, but I do. I say I shouldn't because I've been studying this and nothing should surprise me of how God's going to work and how God's going to move in the life of this prophet or a prophet. But it still blows me away that whoever this guy Nahum is, hears from the Lord, sees the vision, shares this vision. And and what we see in this chapter is a very vivid description of what happened to Nineveh. He, He saw it. He saw it in this vision and somehow he conveys it here on paper, or however he conveyed it at that time. But we have it on paper for us. And, and we read this and we're going, man, that's very, very vivid. And again, we, we sometimes have dreams that you feel like, man, that was so real. That some of you, man, you guys go into stinking detail. Mine is sometimes vague and it's like, I think this happened. It's like, that oh, was kind of weird, you know. But some of you, it's like, man, oh man, it's like, blah, blah, blah. It's like, were you taking notes? while you were asleep because that's kind of almost seems like because you're so but it's that how real it was for you at that moment 
And so however these visions were given to the prophets, they were able to describe it in such a way that, man, oh man, as I'm reading this, and man, you should have seen this morning, man, I'm just getting excited as I'm reading this because, because as I'm reading this and, and going over it and going over it and starting to jot down some stuff, it, it, it almost feels like because he, he shares it and it ends up happening, but it hasn't happened yet, they are, they're not destroyed until 612 B.C., but he's writing somewhere earlier than that. So what he's telling us hasn't happened, but he's writing it as if it has. It seems as though the prophet was watching this movie play out. And it was like in 3D, man. And it was like, zoom, zoom. And, it was, and he was in it. And, and it looked like he was right there because it was happening right before his very eyes. And, and so if you can, picture with me this, this, this voice, again, maybe not the prophet's voice, but this voice that is powerful. You know how, how when you're watching a movie and you already know it's going to be intense because of the music and then you hear this booming voice that just kind of comes in and, and, it, and it overrides the music, if you will. And so picture with me this, 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 this powerful voice as the movie is starting, as the chapter is starting here, and, and you, you hear this intense music coming and you hear this voice that says, He who scatters, he who destroys, your enemies are coming to crush you, O Nineveh. It is right before your face, and there is nothing you can do about it. So you see that the scene is already starting to happen, and, and, and Nahum sees this vision, and he proclaims that. He who scatters has come up before your face. Because you see, in, in Nahum's vision, the prophet now, now sees this mighty army. And this mighty army is advancing and it's almost like you could hear the officers beginning to give orders and beginning to give commands to their soldiers. Guard or, or, or man the fort. Man the fortress, the, the, the ramparts. Watch the roads. Strengthen your flank. Brace yourself. Gird your loins. Fortify, marshal all your strength. Move that thing and that other thing. Move that. You know, he's just kind of throwing commands out there. Do it. And so you, you kind of get this picture of this, this movie going on. But this is the vision that the guy has. And he seemed fairly intense about it. And maybe I'm just making it intense in my own mind, but that's the way I'm reading it. In verse 2, as this is going on, you hear the commands, you hear all this going on, and you hear this, this loud, booming voice once again come, come in and talk about, for the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob like the excellence of Israel. Again, above all those commands that the, that the officers are giving the people about the wall, cover this, go over there, strengthen yourselves, do all these things. And all of a sudden, this powerful voice once again from the Lord, He speaks to His people, Israel and to Judah, assuring them that they will be restored and united once again. For the emptiers, have emptied them out and ruined the vine, their, vines, their vine branches. It, it literally means this, this phrase, for the emptiers have emptied. It literally means that the destroyers have destroyed Judah. And they have stripped away the branches of the vines of Israel. And the Lord... Will, will restore them to splendor. He will restore them to honor. He will do all those things. And again, it speaks of the faithfulness of the Lord because again, they've been chastised. 
They, they've, they've gone through so much, and yet he used somebody to, to chastise them, but now he's coming to their rescue. And it was the Assyrians who had already scattered the northern kingdom. And the voice and, and, and the situation that's going on here is God is telling the Assyrians, there's someone coming after you. You who were the destroyer, the emptier, now you're going to be empty. Now you're going to be destroyed. That's, that's the voice that, that's, that, that's talking over here that is coming against the Assyrians. The city of Nineveh. It was their capital city. Now, again, when he talks about this whole restoration of Israel and of Jacob, we have to understand that we will, they, will not, they will not realize the finality of that until the millennial kingdom. That, that's the ultimate promise. But he will see them through the difficulties that they're going through in this time. Now, what is interesting, again, is that in 7, I think it was 721, the northern kingdom was taken into captivity. And so he's basically talking to the, the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was taken, but the southern kingdom, again, it would be another uh, 210 years before they are taken. And so it's about 620-something, 600, 600, somewhere around there. Um, again, they're going to be destroyed in 612, and it won't be until 586 that the southern kingdom will have to go through their captivity. But again, God's going to be faithful. God will always be faithful. In these instances that we're reading the Old Testament and, 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 and the prophets, again, he is talking about God will restore, but there's a promise, an immediate promise that will happen in their time or in, in the next hundred, few hundred years, but he's also looking far in advance. And that's what blows my mind, that God is faithful to, to deliver them back then. He is still faithful to deliver them today. And it speaks about the faithfulness of God for His people, for and to His people. He will never not be faithful. Again, when He allows things to happen in our lives, oftentimes it's because of our disobedience. It's because we have, we have veered off, we have gone astray, and He loves us enough because He's long-suffering that He will let us go. And when we totally like mess things up, and we have the scars to, sh to prove it. He will draw you back because He's faithful to you. He is always faithful to you. Just like He was faithful to Israel. And even though it might not happen when you want it to happen, <laughs> God will be faithful to you. He will always be faithful to His people and for His people. In verse 3, he, he says, the shields, the shields of his mighty men are made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The, the, the chariots come with flaming torches. And the day of his preparation, and the spears are brandished. The, 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 again, once again, it, it, you, you're looking at, at, at this this vivid picture, and this is what I'm so digging about the book of, of Nahum, is these vivid pictures that he's giving his readers. Again, to, to take your time to go, man, oh man, he is painting this crazy picture that I could see it, because I think if, if we've watched movies, you know, if you watch like Ben-Hur and those old movies, man, you see the chariot races, and, and you see that, and you can almost see the jostling that's going on, right? Again, I'm sure the, the effects are way better nowadays. But be that as it may, you, you see how, how things are happening and, and, and you see this, this thing, this, this picture playing out. And you see this army. The, the, these verses, again, are like a scene. And, and, and he has moved us into this battle and the Medes and, and, and the Babylonians are right on top of the Assyrians. 
And that, that's the picture that we see here, that, that all of a sudden there's going to be this, this battle, and so everybody's getting set. The commanders are being given their command. They're, they're on the ramparts. They're on the walls. They're on the thing. They're, they're watching. They're doing all these things. And then he says, man, the shields of these mighty men, they're, they're, made, and they're made red. learning from the book of Jonah, we know that the city, for him, walking through it was a three days journey. It was a huge city. Some believe that it was over 100,000 people, maybe closer to 150,000. It was a huge city. It was a metropolis for the time. There was a lot of hustle and bustle going on. And so you, you, you can see if you can picture this huge city and all these people going back and forth and, 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 and the command is going out and, and you can almost see there's, a, there's some chaos going on. There's an intensity that, that, that's happening. And, and you almost want to see these, these battles in, in different fronts and, and they're, they're trying to figure out where they're coming from, what's going on. And you could almost see that this invading army, again, when, when, when it talks about them, them you know, the, the redness and, and the red, you know, the, the, they, they wear scarlet and, and, and all the brandishing and all this stuff, it just, there's this red color. And, and, and it seems like, like this invading army was, was fond of the color red. It could speak of all the blood that's already starting to be shed. That, that, that might be on their shields. It could also speak of the sun glistening, glimmering on the shields that were made of bronze or, 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 or the chariots. That, and so you see all this happening because, man, it, it just looks like, man, these guys are going back and forth. They have their, their, their spears and their, they look like, like a forest just coming at you with the spears sticking up before they come down on, on the people. I'm sure part of the scene, this battle scene, has to do with the Assyrian army given the fact that they were very fierce, they were very aggressive, they were violent, and they were brutal. And, and so you're thinking, man, they are gearing up because they know battle. They've been in battle so many times. But the fact of the matter is that they're the ones that are scrambling. They haven't been on defense very much, <laughs> but right now they are. As, as these two combining armies have gathered together, the Medes and the Babylonians, they're coming in, and, and these guys, I'm sure, are, are just taken for a loop here, man, because they're going, wait a minute, what's going on? They, they seem to be overcome or be being overcome, and so the emptiers are being emptied. The destroyers are now being destroyed. Because of the vengeance of the Lord that has come upon them. Again, you got to go back to verse one or chapter one. It's the vengeance of the Lord that is coming against these people. And they can't do a thing about it. Oh, they're going to try to put up a fight. But they really can't do a thing about it. But when, when he says in verse five, he remembers the nobles, they 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 stumble in their walk. They make haste for the wall and, and defend, and the defense is prepared. The, the he, here in this verse, more than likely, in verse 5, is, is the Assyrian king. But he is the one who, who conspired and plotted against the Lord and his people, as we saw in verse 9 of chapter 1. And now he, he's gathered the best of the best, his officers, and he's giving them orders to protect the wall. And, and, and from history, we know that Babylon, or, or not Babylon, but, but, but Nineveh had these amazing walls 
that they were impenetrable, impregnable. There's a word that I, that I looked at. I can't pronounce it, but I loved it. It's like you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't go through there. And so he's giving all these orders to do all these things, but it's too little, too late. And, and even if they were at the height of their, of, of, of their fight, <laughs> they're done. Why? Because the Lord says they're done. The Lord has now <laughs> hired another army <laughs> to take care of these cats. And now they're done. And nothing can be done about it. And again, guys, we need to understand that when we feel defeated, whatever, however we feel defeated because our enemy is against us, whatever the world, uh, whether it's your flesh, the world, Satan itself, however it is that you just feel so defeated, it's like, is your God defeated too? Is your God defeated too? Is, is he quaking in his boots like we see these guys that are scrambling? They're running around like they're drunk because they can't seem to get their bearings because they've never have to be on, on defense like this. Do you think God's on defense? When we're going through those things? And, and, and I know that, again, even with what goes on in our world today, and we feel so down, man, because as a Christian, man, you're the enemy, man. You're the, you're the whatever, you know. It's like, no, be of good cheer. God still has overcome the world. Trials and tribulations? Ah, that's our middle name, isn't it? That's part of our DNA. That's what, that's what we do. That's what we go through. He never said, hey, it's smooth sailing, peeps. Jump on board. It's like, oh, no, there's storms. Jump on board. And, and, and so, again, we can't freak out because it's never too little too late for our God. Even when we feel like we're so defeated that we just want to give up. Again, the Assyrians, man, they were powerful. But instead of marching like heroes right now, they're, they're stumbling around like drunks. That's who they are right now. The leaders, I'm sure, <laughs> thought that, that, again, their fortress was impregnable. I'm not going to. Impenetrable. That was one of the synonyms for that word. But I thought, I'm going to try it now. But their defense proved to be their undoing. They, they couldn't stand up. What, 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 what do we see last, last week in verse 6? Who can stand against his indignation? Nobody. What side are you on? Well, I'm on his side. Great. What can stand against your God? What is it? If God is for you, who can be against you? Well, the world can be against me, and? Well, Satan is certainly against me, and so what? If God is for us, who can be against us? Again, if you're on that side, then you have something to worry about. If your God can't defend you, just like right now, the Assyrians, they had all their gods. Where are they at? They can't fight. They can't move. They have to be carried. Not our God. When he talks about the gates in verse 6, the gates of the river are opened. There was a river, the Kozer River. It's a K-H-O-S-E-R river. K-H. I don't know how to pronounce that. But be that as it may, there was a river that flowed through the city of Nineveh. And so what these guys did, the Medes and the, and, and the, and, and the Babylonians, they, would, they went upstream and they, they dammed up the river. And then they would let it go to go and, 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 and hit the walls. And I'm sure they did it until they finally started being able to knock down some of these walls because it says, and the palaces are dissolved. Again, you can't, you can't stop a, a wall of water. I don't care how big your wall is. So they would go and do that until they, they started destroying the wall and the buildings. And it was only a matter of time before the Medes and the Babylonians got into the city and began to control 
the city. They were on the offense. They understood, man, we got these guys. And yet, they really couldn't take credit for it. For it. Why? Because verse 7 says, it is decreed. It, it, it is decreed. You see, it had already been established by God that the city would be destroyed. And the inhabitants of the city would now be killed and or taken captive. And what we see once again is that the invaders, this time, the Medes and the Babylonians, were just God's instruments to execute His will upon these people. Verses 5 through 7 in the, in the New Living Translation, it says, the king shouts to his officers. They stumble uh, in their haste, rushing to the wall to set up their defenses. The river gates have been torn open. The palaces are also, is, is also to collapse. Nineveh's exiles have been decreed, and all their servant girls mourn in capture, its capture. They, they mourn, they moan like doves, and they beat their, their chest in sorrow. They were defeated. There was nothing left of them. What, what they had done to so many <laughs> is now being done to them. Verse 8 to the end of the chapter. Now Nineveh of old was like a pool of water. Now they flee away. Halt, halt, they cry. But no one turns back. Take spoil of silver. Take spoil of gold. There is no end of treasure or wealth in every desirable price. She is emptied, desolate, and waste. The heart melts and the knees shake. Their pain is in every side and all their faces are drained of color. Where is the dwelling of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions where the lion walked and the lioness and the lion cub and no one made them afraid. The lion tore in pieces enough for her cub, for his cubs, killed, killed for his lioness, filled the cave with prey and the den with flesh. Verse 13, Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword will devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth and the voice of your messengers shall be heard no more. With, with this devastating flood that was now coming in through the city, again, their water source had become something that came against them because these other connivers on this side are saying, I, we'll tear this sucker down. We know what to do. We'll destroy the city. I, I'm sure the Assyrians probably thought, we never tried something like that. Maybe they had. Maybe what they've done is now being done to them. But, but, but this, this exodus that, that is going on because of, the, of what's happening to their city, the prophet Nahum, Nahum compares it to, to water being drained out of a pool. Or, or, or poking a hole in a bucket and it's like, you're done. It's only a matter of time before all of it is gone. And they fled, the, like, 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 or they flowed out of there so rapidly, like water. What a sad thing that's happened to them, right? And, and, and again, you can look at it and go, man, that's, that's kind of harsh. But somebody is yelling, halt, halt, they cry. 
We, we, we don't know who's, who's telling them to halt, but somebody is shouting, stop. But no one turns around. Perhaps because there was nothing left for them. And, and what, what we see again here is, is, is that they had never been on, on, on that side. The Assyrians had, had, had never been on that side. There was nothing left, only panic. Turn back, turn back. No one turned back. Maybe that's where the song came back. No turning back, no turning back. No, I doubt it. (laughs) But it almost seems that the prophet Nahum is now encouraging these victors, these victorious invaders, to, to go and gather up all the spoil. And there was plenty to be had. You see, for all these years that the Assyrians plundered, for all these years, man, that they inv- invaded other kingdoms and they just decimated all of it. They, they, they extracted these, these huge amounts of, of loot, of booty, of, of however, you know, that, that they take. From, from other people, they, they would just simply take all the gold, all the silver, all the precious things, everything that, again, the city of Nineveh was great. <laughs> it was glorious. It had so much that it seemed like, like all their silver and gold was limitless. They had abundance of it. They also acquired a lot of their wealth by taxing people. By tributes, you know, and, and by trade. But, but they, made, they made this place for themselves. And you can imagine when it's a time of feasting, when, when it's a time that, that, man, you're just on top of the world, man, as a country, as a nation, that, man, who, who's going to bring us down? There's nobody that can bring us down, right? It's so funny because it's not funny funny, but it's funny because, man, we were prospering as a nation, huh? Within a year, people are like, Man, oh man, you could see how, how things can turn. That's where these people were at. They had all the gold. They had all the silver. They had lack for nothing. And, and what is interesting, as I was reading, that this prophecy or, or this verse, that, that, that when they were excavating Oh, the ruins of, of, uh, uh, of Nineveh, the, the archaeologists, they, they found nothing. They didn't find any gold. They didn't find any silver. They literally got jacked. <laughs> all of it. They took it all. Whoever, the, these people came in, and, and when he's telling them, hey, go take, go take the, all, all, all that you can take, they, they did. Nineveh was basically stripped away bare of the gold and the silver. She's empty, it says. <laughs> In verse 10, she's empty, she's desolate, she's waste. Man, you, you, you look at that verse right there. And, and what's that old saying that, that, that says, what goes around comes around? It's exactly what happened to them. What they did to so many people, so many nations... Now, Nineveh in particular, not just the Assyrians, but Nineveh in particular, was going through the very same thing that they had done to everybody else. They were being treated the way they treated others. (laughs) And and, and in one sense, their sin had found them out. (laughs) It all came back to them. She's empty. Their hearts are melted. (laughs) Their, their, their knees are shaking. When, when it talks about the pain, you know, again, they see the pain all around them, but maybe perhaps even their, their, their physical being, there's pain all around because of the hurt and, and, and what they're going through. And, and, and it just, again, the, this, this prophet just gives us such vivid pictures and the language that he uses is, is something that you can grasp, that you could see. It's like, yes, these people are despondent. 
It, it looks like of people that, that have lost all hope. They are in the pit of despair. Their life has been sucked from them. And there's nothing left. This is what judgment looks like when God says, I will take vengeance on my people's enemies. I will take it all away. Again, not that we want vengeance on people. Well, some of us do. Again, God, God says, that's not your business, Zeke. It's like, I know, Lord, but I'm so wicked because, again, I want vengeance. And he's like, you don't, you don't want to see vengeance. Not, not, not when God's full wrath is poured out. It's, it's, it, it, it's human beings. <laughs> again, I, I, I know it's like, don't feel sorry for them, Zeke. It's like, I know, I know. God will take care of the wickedness, though. And, and He will do it in a righteous way because I won't. As much as I think I'm so Christian, it, it's, it, it's wicked. But they are in this pit of, of despondency, of despair. Judgment has come. And they have no defense against God Almighty. They have no defense. There is nothing that they could literally do to fix this. <laughs> That's a bad place to be. When, when, when he talks about this, the dwelling, and I thought I was going to finish early. Um, when, when he talks about this in verses 11 and 12, it, it's interesting because he's talking about lions and lionesses and the, the lion cubs and and, and, and what's, what's interesting is that there's a sarcasm there from the prophet. It's this rhetorical question. Where, where's the lion's now? Where's the lion's den now? Where's all the prey? Where's all of that? And he's basically taunting them and he's mocking them. Where is it now? And, and it's interesting because the Assyrians, they loved lions. One of their kings, Sennacherib, he, he says, it's, it's written of, of him like, like a lion I rage. And, and, and a lot of their, their relics and their decorations have to do with lions. And so it's appropriate that he uses that. But now their lairs are, 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 are empty. And they're starving because they have nothing. But this last verse, as we finish up, this is hardcore. When God says, behold, I am against you. How, how, how would you like to hear that one? I'm against you. Uh, mm. You never want to hear that against them. Again, it's, it's, it's bad enough when we hear in the seven churches, you've done all these things, but I have this against you. It's like, oh. This is different here. This is coming from the Lord of hosts. Again, that, that, that phrase, the Lord of hosts, means the Lord of heaven's armies. He's talking about his military might. When you ever, whenever you run it across the phrase, the Lord of hosts, man, oh man, he's, he, he's the, the commander in chief there. And his armies are on it. It's not just man's armies, it's the Lord of hosts. The Lord of heaven's armies. All of it. Full range. And, and so he talks about how he will destroy everything, everything on them. And again, for, for many, many years, people thought that the city of Nineveh was this, was this fable because they could never find any, anything about the city of Nineveh until I think it was back in the late 1800s that they finally start finding some stuff about Nineveh. But it was decimated for a long time. And it's interesting because the people in that area, which today is Mosul in, in, in Iraq, there are Christians there today. And I shared this with you guys when we were going through the book of, of Jonah, that there's a guy, George Sadas, who, who says, we attribute our Christianity, and they're like Catholic, but Christian, to, to Jonah and the time that God spoke to Nineveh. And so there's still people to this day that will attribute their, their God, the God of Israel, because of the, the Old Testament here. And so God is faithful, guys. He will always be faithful. He will never not be faithful in your life and in my life. Amen. 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 Father, thank you so much for our time here.
Thank you so much for this chapter, for the vivid pictures, Lord. I, th I just thank you for giving Nahum, Lord God, a, a, a way of writing that is just phenomenal, Lord, that, that has just captured my heart. And, and to be able, Lord God, just to see it all playing out, Lord. Again, Lord, it was a vision. It hadn't even happened. And yet, Lord God, we read it as if it had already happened. And we know because of history that it did. Lord, you are true to your word. And Lord, when you say that you will avenge, you will avenge. When you say you will bless, you will bless. When you say that you are long-suffering, you are long-suffering, Lord. Lord, we thank you that we can be on your side. If there's anyone who's not, Lord, Father, please, Lord, help them turn. They don't want to be on that other side where you're against them, Lord. So, Father, please do that work, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I thought we were going to be done early. Let's stand as we sing this last song. Bless you guys. <laughs>